widows and orphans and the poor and you know recently I kind of had some sermons along those lines and um, it's harder for us in our culture to take care of the orphans and those without parents uh, so we've got children's homes that do a good job of that and so we uh, we give to them monthly through as the church but also um, you're welcome to do that individually as well uh, our regular contribution the wooden bowls back there on the half wall if you are able to give today that'd be great otherwise uh, make sure you take care of randy's uh, change cans as well so today we've uh, i know we've got some folks out uh, several were mentioned uh, mary lou and dennis both were out today with some sickness uh, and i'm certain we've got other folks doing other things and uh, being busy about uh, God's work, family work, whatever it might be. I'm about to get into that time with uh, calving. I'm probably going to have some folks that will struggle to get in because of calving and taking care of those kinds of things around the ranch. Um, today we're going to sing our three songs that we kind of normally have together. And then Randy's going to bring our sermon and kind of have a, a time at the end where he'll show us about the uh, children's home, a few pictures. So you'll be uh, looking forward to that. And then at the end of that, we're going to have... Um, a time of communion and Randy will kind of lead into that and then I'll come up and have a few words and then we have a couple of guys passing the trays so we'll uh, take a communion at the end of service so you fellows that are helping with that we'll do that near the end of service and you'll see me come up and take care of that um, otherwise we're going to uh, read from Revelation 12 this morning and then we will have a prayer and then a song together so if we would go ahead and stand please Revelation 12 We've been reading through Revelation for the last few weeks, and uh, today we're going to read through verse 9. It will go well with uh, kind of where we're reading through in our uh, time together. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and crying out in birth pains in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule over all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she was to be nourished for 1260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. As we end that verse, I think we can all say what? Amen? <laughs> yes. Uh, Jesus in Revelation, when you get to reading these crazy things about dragons and all these things, and it might overwhelm you, there's a lot of study that can go into that. The end thing you should remember with Revelation is that Jesus wins. That's the message of Revelation, so don't ever lose sight of that. Let's pray together as we uh, continue our worship. Father, as we open up our worship to you today, uh, we do so by reading Scripture. And Father, I think we are blessed by the reading of Scripture, even when it's tough to understand exactly what we're reading, uh, especially the book of Revelation. It has so much imagery, and, but Father, again, we, we know that your purposes uh, win now and forever, and so we thank you for that. We thank you for your word, uh, the power of it, the, the ability it has to change and transform lives, if we will allow it to, Father. Uh, today, we're grateful for everybody coming out to worship. Just It's encouraging to see each other, encouraging to be together. But Father, our purpose today, uh, not only to edify each other, but is mostly to lift up you and to honor you uh, for what you've done for us through your son, Jesus, and through your Holy Spirit. So today, Father, I pray that we'll think about those things and dwell on those things as we spend time singing and praying and uh, hearing about a portion of your word today and just the work of your servants down in Colorado that are taking care of those that uh, don't have anyone to care for them. So Father, we thank you for Randy. We thank you for his work. We thank you for all the employees there at the children's home. We thank you for the donors here in the room that have been giving uh, to that work for years and years and years. Uh, thank you for our congregation being able to use the money that is yours, Father, uh, to bless that work as well. 
And we pray that we just be generous people. Uh, whatever it is that we uh, have, Father, that we would give of what we have and that we would just give generously uh, to your work. Father, today as we uh, continue to worship, I just pray that you would soften our hearts to see you, to hear you, uh, to feel you, Father, that we can truly connect with you in a, in a very personal way. And Father, not just in this one hour or two hours that we're together, uh, but every day as we live our lives, as we go about serving and doing uh, and studying. And we pray all these things through Jesus' name. Amen. Let's have a seat, please. You may remind me as we um, worship in the next few weeks that if I'm not talking on a microphone, then nobody online can hear me, okay? Because I like to turn this off in between songs usually, but um, we have a new system for our folks who are worshiping with us from afar and uh, maybe working on a few of those kinks out, but I do need to be on the mic. So if you don't see me on it, maybe just uh, put your hand to your mouth and remind me and I will be glad to uh, try to do that. So. Um, hallelujah, praise Jehovah. We got some uh, good hymns today. We got some uh, blend of hymns and newer songs kind of together. And uh, let's just worship together today and uh, lift God up as we sing. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. sing redeemed by the blood of the lamb and this is i think they would technically call this a mashup song but it has a lot to do with that old hymn redeemed by the blood of the lamb uh, but it has a, a little bit of a, a different sound to it as well so it's a beautiful song let's sing it together and let's pay attention to the words this morning as we as we worship and uh, meditate on them 
I went down to the crimson river, left my burdens on the shore. I went down, a sinner came up, a saint died with Christ, now I'm reborn. Yes, he was. as we uh, get ready for Randy to come up, um, chose the song, How Shall the Young Secure Their Hearts? And that's one that, I don't know, maybe we, uh, we sung that in the South quite a bit, but you may have never heard of it. I think we've sung it a few times. But it's got a, a beautiful message about securing the hearts of the young by teaching the word. And, and I think that's what Randy and his crew do down there. They, they guide them, they give them a chance that no one else has given. So let's, woo. <laughs> Let's sing that together. How shall the young secure their hearts? How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thy word, the choice as rules impart to keep the conscience in.
All right, and so Randy is about to come up. I'm going to get his PowerPoint pulled up. And I think I've introduced him enough, but we're proud of him. We've gotten to know him for the last 12 years or so. And uh, I will let him come and talk and make sure his mic is on here in a second. And uh, he'll take care of your lesson today. And uh, please pay attention, give him your uh, attention this morning as we worship. Okay, I think I'm on. Yes. Yeah, here we go. Russell, here I'm going to have you pass out that if you don't mind. Good morning, church. Good morning. It is great to be here this morning. I'm home. I grew up in Fairview, Montana, so this is, this is my home country. You know, when I ever come back to Montana, it's just always just a, a comfort that I have. And it's, you are my people. How's that, you know? Uh, there's definitely a difference. Russ and I were talking about in regards to the difference in regards to the culture, you know, from the south to the north. And, uh, you know, there's just something that I think that's what brings about some of them my comfort in regards to just being back to my hometown people, you know. And uh, Montana's a very unique place, and you guys are very blessed. Uh, there, th I travel around to other different uh, churches and, 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 and lectureships and things like that, but... There is nothing like the state of Montana in regards to what Yellowstone, I think Yellowstone Bible Camp pulls the churches together. Uh, I, I do not see that in other states. Uh, so it's very unique in the sense of the strength that's pulled together. Uh, I think the churches recognize that you guys need each other, and I think that's really important. So uh, just appreciate the opportunity to be here, Russ. Russell and I tried to get me here, I think it was about last May or something, you were going to be out of town, and that didn't work for me, but uh, I was at the youth rally in, in Belgrade, and, uh, and I just thought, this would be a great time to come here, so thank you for allowing me to be here, and just appreciate you, uh, you help us uh, help the children's home on a monthly basis, and uh, we just appreciate that, and also the, um, I know there's individuals that help us out also, and we just uh, ask that you keep the home in what we do uh, in your prayers as we care for kids and hopefully what I share today will there's there's I'm going to talk about a bitter spirit um, but then so it's going to intertwine a little bit between what children might be experiencing when they come into the children's home but it also applies to us in regards to how bitter spirit can take control of us so um, am I on conclusion already yeah. That's my sermon. How's that? <laughs> okay, so can I just go back? Okay, there we go. All right. You probably were wondering. This is abbreviated sermon, so, you know, this is really abbreviated, so. Uh, what's that? End and work backward. <laughs> Well, some things I do that way, and it doesn't work out very well, all right, you know? Uh, well, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for uh, times such as this that we can gather together. Father, you are a great God, and you, uh, we look to you in faith and knowing that uh, you love us, you care for us, you guide us, we seek your direction, we seek your spirit to work within us. And Father, may we be timid in regards to your word and, and just sharing that, you know, the word with others. And Father, we live in a, a, a world that uh, there's a lot of pain. And Father, you uh, offer hope for, for all of that, and we're thankful for it. And Father, I ask your blessing upon this congregation. And as they seek to serve you, bless them in their efforts. And be with me as I share this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll share a little bit about the wounded spirit, and I'm, it's going to be kind of a quick, abbreviated lesson, and then I'm going to get into sharing some just slides about the children's home, what we do for the children's home, so that you're aware what, uh, what uh, ministry uh, you are supporting and helping. So, <coughs> excuse me. Well, Mountain States Children's Home has been helping children for 62 years. We started in 1960. Uh, most of all of the children who come in come from troubled family situations. Things are not going well. I mean, there's, there's a reason why they're being placed. In fact, in 2019, we had 1,000 people calling in seeking help for their children. 
uh, there's no shortage of children needing help. And, and, and many, of most of them, over half of them are beyond the scope of what we can do in our program. But the need is out there. Things aren't going well. They really don't want to come to the children's home. You can about imagine how many kids are raising their hands saying, I want to go to a children's home. I, you know, that's just probably not the reality. You know, it's, although once I, I've seen it over and over when children have come on campus and they see what we, we're doing, they say, we want to come because they recognize this so much better than maybe what's going on in their home life. They realize they need help. They all want to be loved. They all want to be accepted. Don't we all want to be accepted, you know? But they're afraid to reach out. They're afraid to reach out to strangers and they have their wall up and they're, they're, they're closed off and their fear of being hurt again. And that's pretty much what the background is, but that they, where they're coming from. But I just want to say that, you know, it's through your support, your monthly support, you help us to demonstrate love, Christ's love. And you help us to uh, paint the picture differently in regards to, you know, there's a different way of life than what they have experienced. And, uh, and building trust in people and seeing that God, there's a God that really loves them. So you recognize what James 1.27 is. <coughs> Excuse me. It said, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So if we want to practice pure religion, there's two things in this passage that really are really clear. One of them is keep ourselves from being in sin. You know, don't adulterate our life with sin. I, that's, I mean, that's pretty clear in that sense. But the other is also, it says to look after orphans and widows in their distress. So I'm going to, you know, you take a look at orphan, you know, I want to expand the, 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 the definition of what we typically think of orphan. When we think of orphan, we think of more both parents are deceased. Well, there's, there's more to it. it you know, Vine's Expository Dictionary talks about um, orphans being one who is fatherless. We see that in some verses, uh, you know, versions of the Bible, if, you know, children that are fatherless. One who is comfortless, one who is friendless. One who is desolate. You know, that kind of starts painting the picture a little bit different. When, when they're desolate, it's kind of like, who do you turn to? You know, I picture, you know, being here. Yeah, that, this is definitely a place, if you're traveling out in the middle of, why, you know, Montana, rather, you know, in your car stalls, you feel pretty desolate. It's kind of like, who do you turn to? And, uh, you know, I have a story with that, but I won't have time to talk about that. My traveling and experiences is kind of neat in regards to how God always protects you. But, you know, I take a look at an orphan is one who is desolate, doesn't, who do you turn to? And you can take a look at growing up in a family situation where they can't turn to their mom and dad. Who do they turn to? So that's kind of where we are. And, and then you take a look at uh, some versions use rather than to look after, it says to visit. And uh, visit, again, has a broader meaning than what we typically th think. It's not one of, okay, I'll visit and pat you on the back and you, you go on. It's one in regards to you identify with the child or the, the, the orphan. But not only the orphan, but you identify with the widow. I think this kind of expands it and realize there's two, two extremes in regards to the young people and older people that they have a need. And you, what you do is when you visit, you identify with them. You take up their cause. All of, a, all of a sudden, now it's starting to get a little bit more sacrificial, isn't it? In the sense of you actually take up their cause, and then you become one with them. You know, what's that mean? Well, you grab them by the hand, and you, you help them through their hard time. You know, and then the verse goes on in regards to, is this during uh, good times? No, it's, it's during times when they are struggling, when they're afflicted. And uh, that's what God wants us to do. Um, children's homes have changed over the years. You know, I, as far as it, definitely in the States, you take a look at, we typically think of children's home providing food, shelter, clothing. I mean, that's, and those are all good things. But what I want to say is those are the easier things that we do for the children. You know, when you see where children who are coming from, the situations they're coming from, uh, they're struggling. And we have to help them in regards to emotionally, helping them to work through the emotional issues that they have, family issues, uh, helping them to work through spiritual things because a lot of times God is not involved in their life. 
But children all love their families, and they all hope that one day things will be better. I mean, I, you know, I think that's the way we look at it as an adult, but you think and look at a child, they want things to be better. But all of them have been hurt. They all have been wounded. And, uh, you know, I want to talk about it in regards to, you know, if, if, a, if, if when you've been hurt, if that hurt is not addressed, it turns into a wound. And then it turns in, you know, so you have anger. And if you have anger, then the next stage is what happens, then it can get into uh, resentment. And then it turns into bitterness. And I see a lot of our children in regards to who come into the care, care are struggling with this and, and they need help to work through this. You know, we live in a wounded world. Uh, we don't have to go very far to find wounded people. We don't have to walk out of this building to find people who are wounded. And it, this all applies to us. And, and so I'm, I'm applying this in regards to children, what, you know, what they're going through and they're orphaned in the sense of they have no one to turn to, but this also applies to us in the sense of we are all wounded. Uh, so I ran across a, um, a seminar I went to. I don't know if anybody heard of the Bill Gothard Seminar, the Institute of Basic Life Principles. And it's a 32-hour seminar, and I, my wife and I have gone through it a number of times, and they, they, it's, you can go through it online now, but it's a spiritual... Um, workshop, but I, I, when we were going through it, I saw this, this uh, um, flow chart, basically, of the stages of a wounded spirit, you know, and I, and I started realizing, this is what our children are going through, I see, because every one of them coming into care are wounded, and you take a look at it in regards to as they, um, the, it starts out with a wound, and uh, it could be a wound of a, you know, a father's not being involved in their lives. There may have been some abuse or neglect that may have happened. There may have been, you know, the father's promised lots of different things and they never carry through. But that turns into a wound. And if that wound is not addressed, what happens is that the child will start alien affection to their, children, to their parents. They start pulling away from their parents. There's silence at the dinner table. Or maybe they retreat to their bedroom and they have not a lot of association with their parents. The next stage, what happens is they start rejecting authority. I know I'm supposed to love my parents, but look what they keep doing to me, you know? And pretty soon the scale tips, doesn't it? You know, because they're trying to keep loyalty to their parents, but then they recognize this, this, this is too much. But I want you to start and look at this. Well, I'm, I'm talking about children, but I want to also take a look at, this applies to us as marriages. You know, when your spouse wounds you, what do you do? You start alienating your affection. You start pulling away from your spouse. Then I want you to apply it also to wounded members. Church, you know, a lot of times we have members wounding members. And we start going the same direction in regards to um, alienating our affection. Well, look what that member has done over here. You know, I have an issue with him, so I'm going to alienate my affection. I'm just not as close to that person. So I want you to broaden your, your thoughts about this as you go through this, because it can apply to a child. It can apply to our marriages. It can apply to uh, us being, you know, wounded in the, in, in the church, too. But rejection, so what happens is a wounded spirit, then the alienation of affection, then it turns into rejection of authority. I think a look in regards to a, a, a member who is wounded. You take a look at, I know God wants me to love my brother, but, you know, so you start rejecting God's authority. But then what happens with the child, when they start rejecting parental authority, they start taking on themselves as being the authority. And they start making decisions. Well, I, you know, I'm going to run with my own friends. I develop, they develop another support system, you know, after that, because that's where, they are moving away from their parents. You can do that as a wounded member or, a, a, you know, a spouse. In regards to we start taking ourselves, putting ourselves in a position of authority, minimizing God. Uh, we start turning to other friends or whatever. We can just start saying, do you know what so-and-so did over here? So we start recruiting our support system out here to justify what we're doing. And, and then the next stage is what happens. We move, kids move into sensual behavior. You can see a lot of drugs, uh, p kids getting into maybe drugs, alcohol, sex. It could be uh, skipping school, telling a t parent off. Anything that gives them the emotional high and what it does, it helps them to escape the pain from the real wound. 
And then what happens is if that continues, they, start, they get the next stage is guilt. You start feeling guilty because you know you're messing up. And, you know, so what do you do when you don't feel well? And it's kind of like the alcoholic. If you don't feel well, well, if we're good about things, then you start drinking more. And then you feel guilty about it. And then you go, got to drink more. And it's just a cycle. I see a lot of kids are caught into this sensual cycle. And they don't even know what's going on. It's just, you know, how, uh, they don't have the insight to see that what's going on. And, you know, one of, one of the things that I see that, uh, what we do is trying to help them to go, we go, take them back to the wound and help them to address and heal the wound, whether it's real or perceived. So, you know, a perceived wound becomes real to us. And we have to help them to work through that. And when you help them to work through the wound, the spirit that they have, you can start seeing all these other symptom problems go away. And I, you know, when I first learned this, I just thought this puts a framework around to where I understand what's going on because I've been wounded before. And I can tell when I, my, I start going down that direction, I start alienating myself from that person and I start justifying and rationalizing, well, I should be doing this. And, and I have to realize, no, I am not going to let Satan take me down this road to help healing that wounded spirit. I've shown this to parents before and I've seen parents, I said, this is where your child is in regards to the wound that they have. And this is the, the sequence is what happens afterward. And they just gloss over and it's just kind of like, that's me. That's, that's what I did with my parents. So you can almost see a, you know, here generational, it just starts going on in generations. You know, what I want to say is that Satan is the master of deception. He loves to ensnare a child from an early age because they are not equipped to know how to deal with the wounds. And a lot of times we as parents don't know or don't have the, equipped, the, the, the skills to deal with that. But a child is not, is not equipped. And if he can get them focused on their bitterness, he may just have them for this life and he will have them for eternity. You know, the definition of bitterness is harboring resentment for things that others have done to you. It's, it's, it's just an entrenched animosity toward, toward another. It's really, you know, it's a hatred toward another person. The Greek word for, for bitterness means to make fast, to, to cling tenaciously to. How many, how many of you have ever really struggled with bitterness? You know, I think that we all in one way or another have struggled with bitterness. And you know how it just, it just, it just sticks to you tenaciously and it's hard to get rid of. Most of the children who come into the children's home are blind to it. They don't recognize what they're, they're going through. I mean, they're, they're too young. They don't have that experience. I've been involved in the interview process in the past years. I haven't lately, but I would sit back about 20 minutes and we'd have the parent, we'd have the child, we'd have all of the other staff like house parents and counselors and, and, and I would just kind of observe what was going on. Then I'd start asking the kids, I'd say, are you angry? No, no, I'm not angry. Are you frustrated? No, no. Then I'll ask them, how have you been wounded? There's something about, if I ask you, are you angry or frustrated? No. If I ask you how you have been wounded, it goes to the heart. I mean, it, it goes to the heart. It just cuts through everything because your mind takes you right to where you have been wounded. And I've taken that, I talked to the kids that way and they all said, well, what do you, what do you mean? And I, I said, what do you wish you could change in your life or with your family? And a lot of times you start seeing the tears come to their eyes. And then you know you're on to what they're really struggling with. And then they'll, you'll hear, well, I just wish I had a dad. I've had three dads and none of them want to have anything to do with me. I just want a dad that plays ball with me. You know, just that yearning in regards to that. They don't want to talk about it. If they, they don't want to admit it. It's too painful. If they talk about it, it's just too painful. So they'd rather put it on a shelf and not deal with that. And if they let go, sometimes they like to hang on to it because if they can hang on to it, then it's kind of like my parents will see that and they'll know how angry I am and they'll surely they're going to turn around and do what, you know, what they need to be doing. Well, that doesn't always work. They give excuses. They create behaviors that keep themselves from looking at what the real issue is. Or they create other issues so that we as the parents don't see what the real issue is. I'm going to turn to uh, Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. I'll read that. and that's, It deals with bitterness. And uh, it says, uh, time-wise, I'm, I'm just going to move on here. So it says, make every effort to live in peace with all men. And be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one misses the grace of God. And that no bitter root grows up.
to cause trouble and to file many. You know, that's just a powerful passage. You know, you take a look at what, um, you know, we have an opportunity. I take a look at the children who come into our care, how they're dealing with bitterness and struggle. They struggle with that. But it talks, you know, how you know, make every effort to live peacefully with all men. You know, sometimes we like to argue with God in regards to just say, well, how about the man I like? No, no, no. It says we need to make every effort to do that. But it goes on and it says, without holiness, no one will see, see the Lord. You know, it, it, verse 15 starts off, it says, see to it. How many have had parents that tell you that? You know, I remember growing up, if my parents ever said, Randy, see to it, what did that mean? That was a top priority. I better take care of that, you know. And so it starts off as see to it so no one misses the grace of God. We need, we need to understand the true principle of God's grace and his love and his favor for us because failing to understand this can cause us to uh, lead to a bitter spirit and how important it is for us. Uh, it, well, it'll also lead to us to uh, we'll miss out on the grace of God. But how important it is for us to understand, you know, that uh, God's grace and his forgiveness and his love and his mercy that he gives us and how important that is for us to be able to forgive. It goes on in regards to see to it. It says, see to it that no root of bitterness grows up to ca and causes trouble to defile many. We had a lady that lived in, in Denver and we're probably 45 minutes from her house in downtown Denver. But she came out to campus and she said, I want a beautified campus. So she invested in planting trees and planting, you know, to put uh, drip systems and flower beds all over and, and, and really did a great job. And uh, she, she came out and worked in the flower beds after she put them all in here. And, and after a while, she came to me and she said, I had never understood what bindweed was. Now, I don't know if, in Fairview, we called it Creeping Jenny. I don't know what you call it here, but I know you have to have it. You know, it doesn't have any, it doesn't need any water. It doesn't have to have good soil. And it's just, it's, uh, uh, it grows everywhere. But anyway, it, she lived downtown in her, in Denver, where there wasn't any bindweed. So she came out and, you know, she spent all of her time, you know, you, you'd hoe it, you'd pull it, you'd spray it. And, you know, all of our time was spent on it, and it chokes out the good and the beauty of the flowers that she was planting. And, you know, we may need to understand how bitterness can become our focal point and how it can also choke out things in life. We have to realize how it can consume us, how it can consume others and destroy others, and how, you know, it is just that tenacious thing that we, it's hard for us to get rid of. I take a look at what an opportunity we have to help children who are in the grip of the master of deception. One who loves to deceive, one who loves to choke out life so they can't see God and his truth. And what an opportunity we have to help them see God's grace and his bitterness, uh, holiness and his peace. Let me go on here. So Ephesians 4, 31, it says, get rid of all bitterness rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. You know, our hope needs to, our focus needs to be on the hope that we have in Christ, not on the bitterness. And it's real easy to get off focus when we are going through hard times and have bitterness and how important it is for us to, to work through that. You know, there's, couple of things just to, to leave you with this message in regards to this is, you know, basically, you know, we know that we all live in a wounded world. We don't have to go very far before we find wounded people. Some of us are wounded, but we need to make sure that we pass this message on of forgiveness to a wounded world because the world is, is, is not very gracious in many ways, you know, and uh, God is loving and, and gracious to us. And there's one other thing in regards to we need to make sure that we don't wound others so they miss out on the grace of God. Sometimes I don't think that we think about that, but how important it is for us to be careful that we do not wound others so they miss out on the grace of God. You know, I want to say every child is at the mercy of someone to care for them. They look to have someone to care for them. Uh, they look to have someone to provide for them, protect them. And yes, even discipline them. 
But behind all of the hurt and the pain and the fear that they're going through, they're just like you and me, try, you know, trying to do, survive the best that we can with what tools that we have had. But God has given us a lot of tools and, and grace that, that will help us to heal. What I want to say is through your support, you identify, you, you identify with the children that we're dealing with. You take up their cause and you become one with them. And I want to say thank you for that because that's, that's what you're doing through your support and helping us to do that to care for the orphan. You help us to heal the wounds. You help us to break Satan's grip of deception. You help us to create a new vision and a new hope for them so they do not miss out on the grace of God. And I just want to say thank you for that. That's just very important to the work that we do and very important to the work or to the children who we deal with. So I'm going to leave the message at this time. I have a story that I want to share later in regards to that. So I'd like to go to uh, show you some visual pictures of what we do at the children's home. Thank you, Russ, for coming up and switching that over. You would not want me to do that. We'll be here for another 10 minutes. We will mess it up, all right? We'll start at the beginning this time. That's probably a good idea. I like that. That's better. Well, uh, this is actually a picture of uh, the children's home um, before Long's Peak is what it is. But, you know, we're located in Longmont, Colorado. And uh, there are th about 35 brotherhood homes within the Churches of Christ. We're the farthest north. There's nothing north of us. There's nothing west of us. And, uh, you know, we want to be a referral source if you know of any children who... Um, have need we we get kids from all over most of them along the front range in Colorado but that's probably about 40, 50 to 60 percent but the rest come from all over because on the website we we have all you know, people just contacting us from all over um, I kind of touched base on this where the kids come from you know most of them come from broken homes most time it's neglect and abuse uh, abandonment issues all come uh, the most popular common scenario is a single mom crying out because dads are not involved and I uh, if dads would be involved as God wants them to be <laughs> we could pretty much shut down children's homes because that's where the biggest issue is um, a few years ago we sat down and just said what what is it that we do what makes us different and we as we process this we come up with Luke 2.52, it says, where Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. We just thought, that's what we do. We cover those four areas, educationally, physically, spiritually, and socially, and helping children to be equipped to enter the world and be successful. Uh, this is a building that we moved into about 2008. Uh, it is our school and gym. We started an on-ground school in 98. And what we used to do, send kids to the public school, within two days they were like magnets to other kids who were wounded. And they were, they, they were in sensual behavior, skipping school, uh, truancy, things along that line. That's where our kids were familiar with because of they coming from a broken home. And so we started the on-ground school. We cut out that negative peer group to where th they didn't have that influence. And the amazing thing is, is my, my wife started and headed up, and she said, it's amazing. Some of these kids have probably been expelled from school. And she said, in two, three weeks, they're just working their tails off doing their homework. I mean, it, it's kind of like, well, great, that's what we want. And uh, there's a couple of pictures here in regards to, you know, what, uh, uh, what we, uh, you know, we have, you know, as far as the kids. But one of the things that we, I noticed I was a, a slide behind all the time. I was, and I was looking over on the other side. Sorry about that. Uh, the average improvement, what we did is a 12-year study to find out, are we doing anything? What are we doing with these kids? And what we found out is what we, we were helping the kids. We did a pre-test and a post-test. Average improvement is 3.7 grade levels in one year academic. It, it just changed their whole attitude. And, 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 of course, that opened up to where they wanted to follow us and, and learn other things in regards to what was going on. Um, you know, as far as physically providing them, uh, here's just some of the cottages. I'm going to just go right through that. Uh, homes where we place six kids to, to a house, and we have husband and wife teams that care for the kids. This is a house that we uh, built like a habitat house. Uh, we moved in it in 2000 uh, or about six years ago. 
And um, I have another story for another one that's being built. Uh, we have cross-team uh, trainers that come out and they start working with us. They're certified uh, CrossFit uh, trainers and they work with our kids. So physically, we help them to grow. Uh, and everything they do in this is it, taking a look at hardships, you know, physically working through an exercise, whatever, and then afterward taking and say, what did that teach you? And helping them to realize the hardships, not only just physically, but going through life and how that can be applied in a spiritual sense. Uh, we're under the eldership of the Longmont Church of Christ. That's the backbone of why we do what we do and what makes us different. Uh, we have youth groups that come out and do uh, stay for a week and they work around on campus and they have devotionals with our kids. We have uh, two therapists that work with the kids and the families and helping them to work through the wounds and the struggles that they're going through. Uh, this is a group session here. This is one of the things that I think that's really pr pr pretty neat. We needed to say, how are we helping the kids emotionally? And so we have an assessment that we, they use that, uh, that it's a self-assessment and it measures it regards all the areas of therapeutic concern. Um, let me go to the next one. Here, it, you know, uh, the, the areas that, do, you know, that it, it assesses in regards to where we need to focus our therapy and helping with school problems, family problems, depression, self-esteem, personal stress, uh, confused thinking, guilt, father problems, aggression, disturbed thinking, mother problems, friend problems, memory loss, drug use, uh, alcohol use, suicide, and it, it measures all of these things. What I want to... Here we go. I'm going back over here. Yeah, I'm still not doing this right here, am I? What I want to point out here, though, at the time of placement, you take a look at over here on the green, 48% come in with 10 to 16 areas of therapeutic concern. Uh, upon discharge, uh, that should be after a year, we do another assessment. The green is totally gone. None of them have that many areas of therapeutic concern. On the left again, regards to the time of placement, 47% have five to nine areas of therapeutic concern. Well, that has shrunk to over on the right side, 17% have five to nine areas of therapeutic concern. At the time of placement, 5% have zero to four areas of therapeutic concern. After a year, you take a look at, look how large the blue is. 83% only have zero to four areas of therapeutic concern. I would eventually say that probably there's zero to four areas of therapeutic concern that is in every one of us in this room in regards. So we know we are making a difference in regards to helping the children to work through some of the struggles that they're, uh, they're going through. We have a, a Pratt Management Company built that office building. That's a whole unique, neat thing how God had opened up the door for a company to build an office building. We started a thrift store, and uh, this is inside of the thrift store, and it, we were worried in regards to whether we'd have enough items to be donated. We have to turn people away. We love what you do. Here, take, take what you want, and I'll take, the, I'll take the rest over to Goodwill, because we like what you do. I mean, it's just neat to see how the community has just really embraced us in so many ways. Um, Another, I had a story, and one of them, uh, there was a, a husband and wife came in and said, my wife, my wife and I went into the thrift store, and my wife was walking around, and she was, she was doing this. And he said, what are you doing? Well, this doesn't smell like the other thrift stores. <laughs> we thought, yes, that's what we want, you know? Uh, you know, we do food runs, and, you know, this is the kids, you know, they were unloading a bunch of uh, food, so you guys have help, helped out before with the foods. It's really interesting to watch the kids looking in the boxes as they're carrying in the food, because they're looking and eyeing, what are they going to be eating? So, uh, you know, we have a, a Coloradans, it's a car show club. They helped us, and I'm going to share a story about this at the end here in regards to, you know, they... they they did it in town and it defensive. The city had permits and they had to hire uh, more policemen. They had to hire more trash people. And they, and they finally said, can we do the show, car show out at the children's home? I said, yeah. So they come out and they all love it. They said, we love to see where the profits, because they, there's a, the net proceeds go, come to the children's home. We love the way that the, the, what you guys do. And, and the kids go around and they're just shaking hands with all of, the, all of these people. And they love it. And, you know, so 450 people will attend and come out to the children's home. 
and it just a way of opening up the doors in regards to the community, in regards to what we do, you know, as a children's home and church and the ministry, what we do. Um, we have a, a big auction in October. Uh, recently, we bought this uh, a apartment complex for kids that cannot go back home and they graduate from high school. The state says, you've got to be off campus. Well, they, they floundered. It struggled with all of that. So we start. We bought this apartment complex. It's in Berthoud, which is, some of you guys know where Berthoud is. You know where the, right across from the park, where the, uh, the, 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 the uh, apartment complex is. Perfect sizes, small little units for our kids. To, when they graduate, they can go to community college or, you know, we got one at OC and we got one in, this, in the, uh, uh, actually, Colorado State University. But perfect for this. And it was... That's a whole nother story. I, I, I have had more time. I would get into that. And then here, homemade, we're just built by this house. It was just uh, dedicated about two weeks ago. Homemade, which is a nonprofit put together by the Home Builders Association, six years ago, come up and said, when we built the other house, they, they found out about it. And they says, well, we want to build you a house. Uh, oh, okay. And they, you know, and so we they dedicated that they... The percentage, they said that they would provide 40 to 60% of the cost. The house is going to cost, it costs about a 1.2. We spent 300000 All the rest was donated from suppliers and contractors and stuff. Community has just been so great. After we went through the dedication, at the end of the day, they said, okay, when's your next project? <laughs> they're, they're ready. And so this year, we're, we got approval from Boulder County to build another house. And so we need to replace some houses, too. But they're on board in regards to doing as many as, I mean, th we have two more that we have plans for, and they're going to build, build those for us. God is so good. He just has opened up doors uh, over and over. And uh, in the last six weeks, we've had four baptisms from our kids. Um, COVID was tough on us. Um, no youth group activities, not being able to attend church, you know, or online church, you know. Kids coming from a non-church background, it's kind of like, what is this? You know, church is online. I mean, I was just, you know, but as soon as we're back to in the, you know, what we are doing, we're seeing major uh, growth, you know, in the kids. So very fun things to do. Come see us. Come visit us. You know, we, we'd love to give you a tour. If you have a camper, we have a place where Sojourners, you know, park. You can come there, and uh, we just... Uh, would love to have you come. Again, thank you for what, what you're doing. So I'm going to share a story. Um, the, uh, I showed you the car club. They've been helping us for 30 years before even I came, and they love what we do. Anyway, they, uh, years ago, they asked me, they called me, I mean, what, what they, they'd do this car show, and the net proceeds would come to the children's home. And Terry Campbell, one of the president, he was president at that time, he called me up and he says, Randy, you know, the club said we would like to have you come out and we want to make it Mountain State's Children's Home's Choice. I want you to come out and choose a car. It'll be Mountain State's Children's Home's Choice. Would you do that? And I said, yeah, I, I, I can do that. Yeah. And I hung up and I, the phone and I just, um, I struggled, you know, it just didn't settle well and I, I, called Terry back up and I said, uh, Terry, I, I don't feel good about me choosing a car. You know, it's Mountain State Children's Home's Choice. And I, and I said, what I'd probably recommend is maybe what we do is have one of the kids choose a car. I think that would be better than me doing it. And he said, I think that's a good idea. So we, you know, we, we had a girl that was her, Adri is her name, and she, she was like 14. She came in. She was a professed atheist. And I remember thinking, do we take a professed atheist into a ch Christian children's home? You know, would, and we had talked about that a little bit, and it's kind of like, no, she needs to know Christ. And within three or four weeks, she started asking questions in our on-ground school. She'd asked my wife, she says, Janice, what? what does the Bible say about what's heaven like? And then she started asking all kinds of questions and within a short period of time, she was baptized. She had just a colorful personality. I mean, it was just kind of unique and you couldn't have what not love her because she just was kind of bubbly and all of that. So I asked her if she would like to choose a car. She um, 
jumped at it. She was just excited. So the day came, there's 300 cars out there, and we started going up and down the roads, two hours up and down the road. I like this one. Oh, I like this one. Randy, this one here, this one looks good. And I was, I was sitting there thinking, oh, great. You know, we're going to be here for a long time. I said, Adri, you need to choose five cars that you like, and then we'll narrow it down from there. So she chose five cars, and the five cars were ones I probably wouldn't choose, but they were some weird willow, willies, DeSotos. They were kind of strange, weird-looking cars. I mean, they were decent cars. I mean, they were... And she chose them, and I said, okay, this is what's going to happen. I said, you got the five cars. you got to choose one, and what we, gotta, I, we have to take your choice back to them. So that what they're going to do is line up all the cars, and you're going to be able to hand out the trophy to the car that you chose, and, but they need to get them all lined up. So I said, so let's get back and get the, your choice back. So we were walking along, and she stopped at this 72 Nova. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've never had that before, <laughs> but they are pretty cool. <laughs> Rusted out fenders, you know, kind of like the old Toyota trucks, you know, they, you know, they were, they run forever, but the fenders are all rusted out. You know, it was primer gray. The seats were just short, torn up, just shredded. And, you know, the hood was open and the motor was painted orange. Okay, I, I give it credit, you know, and I was... You know, she just stopped and she just started looking. I, this car, I really like this car, Randy. I really like it. And I said, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's an all right car, but we need to get your choice over. And I was trying to move her along, you know, to get the choice <laughs> over to line up the cars. And, and she, she just kept looking at it. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, no, not this car. <laughs> and I said, there's a lot of cars out here and pa fancy paint jobs and leg pipes and superchargers are just... Lots of nice, really, you know, thousand dollars of paint jobs. I mean, just, and I was just going on, and, it's, and she kind of pulled me over, and she said, Randy, I really want to choose this car because it had potential, just like me. <laughs> you know, I, you know, kids can say things that just really kind of wake you up to realize. I was thinking, oh, great, this piece of junk, Mountain State Children's Home, choice but you know you could be assured the whole car went through and it was explained why she chose that car but I think sometimes we can look at children or adults or whatever they're pieces of junk because of whatever is going on in their lives and but aren't we thankful for God's grace that he can make us new again like you know, that old car could be made new again, but God can make us new again and holy in His sight. And aren't we grateful for uh, those that help us to do that and to know, know God and know His, you know, what He can do for us. You know, I, I take a look at, you know, this is what you do by helping the children's home so our kids don't miss out on the grace of God. And we're thankful for that. And aren't we thankful that we have a God that loves us and cares for us and is willing to send his son to die on a cross that we can be made new again. There may be somebody that wants to be baptized. You know, maybe they're one of, you want to become a Christian. Maybe there's somebody here struggling with bitterness and a wounded spirit and you need the prayers of the church. You know, I'm sure this congregation will help you in whatever way. I'm going to turn it over to Russ you know, to lead us in the Lord's Supper. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I tell you, <laughs> I just about ugly cried during that. Woo! You don't want me ugly crying, but thank you, Randy. It was uh, it was special, and. Really, the, the communion thought, uh, he led us right to the door of communion. And I had a verse picked out this morning uh, here in um, 2 Peter 3 about Christ's return. And so I'll just, just give you a few seconds of that, and then we'll uh, sing along with a song while the gentlemen pass out the trays, and we'll partake of communion together. The grace of God, the grace of Jesus, uh, through his Holy Spirit, bringing Christ to the cross. We know that story. All of you know that story well. And I think sometimes we, um, 
it becomes routine. Uh, in Second Peter 3, he talks about this way of stirring you up to sincere reminder, <laughs> reminding us of that grace. And that's what we've had this morning, the grace of, a, a, of God on a young lady being cared for by someone who's not her family. Uh, Jesus takes us in as orphans, doesn't he? <laughs> that's the exact wording that he uses. We're, we're heirs to a promise that we don't deserve. We, we're not a part of that family. He brings us into the fold. Jesus is going to return again. That's what Second Peter 3 talks about, is the fact that we serve a risen Savior, not one who's still in the grave, who's one who overcame. So as I close today, he talks about here in the end that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the God. Hastening, you, you pray, Lord, come quickly. I want to be where you are. I want this brokenness that we all see, that we experience. We want it to come to an end, and one day it will. We can help those young women. We can help people in our own midst. We can help ourselves. But God's going to wipe away all those tears. That according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. We get to bring a little bit of that down to heaven, to, to earth now. We get to be the people that usher that in by bringing a little bit of the holy down to earth through the pain and the sorrow. We can do that through children. We can do it through ourselves. We can do it through our families. That we do it through the grace of God. We're going to partake of communion together as we remember uh, what God has done through it for us through his grace. So if we could go ahead, fellas, and we'll pass out the trays. We'll sing the song Exalted uh, this morning as we do. After that, after everybody's received the elements of uh, communion, I will have a prayer and then we'll partake of those together. <clears throat> So today, like we do each week, we have the opportunity to partake of the bread and the cup. And these things remind us of the grace of God. They remind us of his love for us. They remind us of his plan for us. That each of us matters. That each of us are watched and loved and cared for. Let's pray. 
Father, as you have so graciously given us your word that expresses such beauty and um, clarity of thought regarding your love and your grace and your mercy. Uh, Father, as Randy's talked to us today about what that looks like at the children's home of showing that to young people, we recognize you show that to the world each day. Father, we know that culminates to some degree in the sacrifice of Jesus. But Father, if it had ended there, um, we would be honoring a good man. But Father, we honor a Savior who reigns today. He lives. So thank you. Thank you for that thought. Thank you for the, uh, the willingness of Jesus to submit to you. It's a model of us of submitting to you, Father, of giving our hearts over to you. So we do that through communion today. As we partake of the bread, as we partake of the cup, we do that in fellowship, uh, Father, and we do that in um, purity of heart as we are so grateful for what you have uh, planned and done for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's partake of the bread. in the cup until he returns again. Thank you all for your willingness to let us go a few minutes over. I told Randy you would not walk out. <laughs> he usually has probably an hour and a half to deliver, and we, we don't have a Bible study, so I said just work it all together. If we go over, it's going to be okay. Uh, Randy, if you would like, uh, you can go on back and stand by your uh, table. If you have questions for Randy, if you would like to give him a, a $10,000 check, uh, whatever it might be, <laughs> just planting the seed, Randy, okay? I was probably unaware of how much they're doing. <laughs> I, I think I had a clue, but really uh, I don't think I had a clue. When you look at the expanse of that campus, the number of kids, um, there's a lot going on. And you might be like, well, they built them a free building. Um, now you got to pay the bills on that building, right? <laughs> I'm certain uh, utility bill alone, probably tens of thousands of dollars, if it looks like, from all those buildings. But um, they need our help, our support. We do give monthly. Uh, we've evaluated maybe increasing that at some point. And, uh, but today, you have the opportunity to write a check, uh, give them some cash, whatever it might be. He came to Belgrade Youth Rally and visited there a little bit and then stopped in here in Lewistown. So... We're grateful that he was here today. So say thank you to him as, he walk, as you walk out. And if you're able to bless him a little bit with the uh, help of the orphans and those that don't have parents down there in, in Colorado. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's close with a prayer and then you'll be dismissed. Father, we are so grateful that you um, do for us each day. You are good to us. And Father, you are gracious and merciful. Father, we... We don't, we struggle when we wound others. I, I pray, Father, when we do that, that we are repentant. And repentance means we change, Father, that we turn away from those things. And I pray, Father, that we'll do that when we wound others. I pray that we'll be people that do not give in to bitterness, that we don't allow others to bring us down and, and hurt us in such ways that we turn away from you. So, Father, thank you for the message today. Thank you for your word. Uh, I pray that you would be with each of us. Uh, Father, I know there are hurting hearts, and I pray that you would um, open up opportunities for healing. I pray that you would deliver, Father, uh, when there seems to be no way out. Father, thank you for this uh, group, for this building, for this church that you've given to us. And we pray that we'll honor it with our lives and with our service to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, folks. We will uh, be blessed to be back on Wednesday if you're able.